All right, we're in Acts chapter number 18, starting a new chapter in our study in the book of Acts. And we'll start with a summary of what's in the chapter, and after we do the summary, we'll put the map up for a moment for you to get your bearings on where Paul's at in this second journey. But in Acts 18, he concludes his second journey with a lengthy stay at Corinth. That's verses 1 to 18. He's there for over a year and a half. And then there's a brief visit at Ephesus in verses 19 to 21. He'll come back on his third journey and stay much longer. And then from Ephesus, he sailed to Caesarea and went up to Jerusalem uh, before returning to his home church in Antioch. All of that's in verse 22. A lot of people miss this visit back to Jerusalem because it's just, uh, it's just mentioned so briefly in that verse, but it's there. Um, after spending some time in Antioch, he began his third journey by going through all the country of Galatia and Phrygia to strengthen uh, the churches there, and that's verse 23. And so the chapter concludes with the account of Apollos, who was a disciple of John the Baptist, and um, we have the account of him coming to know the way of God more perfectly. In other words, he was brought up to speed on what God was doing and was shown uh, Paul's ministry, and that was through the influence of Aquila and Priscilla. That's verses 24 to 28. We're going to try to look at verses 1 to 17 this morning with Paul's stay at Corinth, and so we'll put the map up. You can take a glance at that if you want, and it'll show you he left Athens and came about 45 miles down to Corinth, and um, I'll say just a word about the city. As I've already mentioned, we're not going to go on and on and on about details of these places, uh, but just give you a little bit of background. Um, you, you can see its location is on an isthmus, and there's two harbors, and so Corinth was a major center for trade and for travel, and uh, the famous Isthmian Games, the Isthmian, I guess because it's near Corinth on an isthmus, but it's like the Olympics, they were held there, and uh, you know, you recall in 1 Corinthians 9 where Paul said, Know you not, they which run in a race, run all but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. And he was using the games they were familiar with as an illustration. But Corinth had about 200,000 people. It was a metropolis. It was a very strategic place to start a church. Uh, from this location, the gospel could spread. And, and so uh, it, it's a great place to start a church, but certainly not an easy place. Corinth is uh, known as the Vanity Fair of the Roman Empire, and its reputation was not just for commerce, really its main reputation was for immorality, um, gross immorality. In fact, it was a byword. If you were a real wicked person, they called you a Corinthian. <laughs> and so the famous temple of Aphrodite, the so-called goddess of love, was there, and fornication was actually part of the temple worship. And so the fact that a church was established in Corinth, and it seems to be one of Paul's larger churches, I mean, that demonstrates the power of the gospel, the grace of God. In 1 Corinthians 6, he said in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Notice verse 11, such were, past tense, <laughs> such were some of you. They're not now because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, trusted his death, burial, and resurrection for their salvation, and being in Christ, he said, you are washed. That's not with water, that's spiritual. Spiritual washing of regeneration, Titus 3, verse 5. It's a washing of the Holy Ghost. You're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's by His authority. It's based on who He is and what He's done for us. And it's by the Spirit of our God. The power of the gospel. These people, I mean, you look at those things He mentioned. He said, such were some of you. That's not who you are now. Once you're in Christ, He's our identity. We're a new creature in him. And by the way, uh, if you know anything about the church at Corinth, uh, you know it was a carnal church. They were walking after the flesh, and Paul had to rebuke them for that. And yet in 1 Corinthians, which is an epistle of rebuke and correction, he starts off by talking about how they were sanctified. 
And then he says it again here in 1 Corinthians 6, that they're sanctified. Now, you need to understand the difference between positional sanctification and practical. Uh, that's, that's rightly dividing standing and state. Our standing is our unchangeable position based solely on Christ and who we are in Him. Uh, but the state is our changeable condition. It has to do with our practice. So if you're saved, you're sanctified. But we need to act like it. There is the practical aspect of that. Someone emailed me just recently because I was saying something about practical sanctification. They, they said, aren't we all sanctified? Why do you have to preach uh, for people that, you know, that they need to be sanctified when they already are? Well, we already are for say. The problem is a lot of people don't act like it. And Paul rebuked them for that. He said, you're carnal. He said, you, you, you are sanctified, but you're not acting like it. So there's that practical aspect. And so what it is, the practical sanctification comes through knowing who you are in Christ, believing that by faith, and walking in that. So you got to understand the difference between standing and stay. A lot of people don't get that. I, I mean, it's clearly in the Word of God. There is a distinction there. One doesn't cancel, cancel out the other. They're both, it's both important to see. Now, Acts 18, we'll begin with verses 1 to 3, and Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla. Acts 18, verse 1, After these things... Paul departed from Athens. He preached to the people on Mars Hill. Some believed, seems like just a handful. Most of them mocked him for his message. Uh, others procrastinated, said, oh, we'll hear it again later. But there's no record of a church being started in Athens. Paul was there. He wasn't there very long, and he departed because the people weren't receptive. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy. Pontus is in, uh, I believe it's Asia Minor, up near Bithynia in that region. But they were living in Italy. But they had left Italy to come to Corinth with his wife Priscilla. And the reason why they departed from Italy, here's the parenthetical statement, because that Claudius, that would be the Caesar, had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. Now, that's not uncommon. In history, you can see how the Jews have been a despised people as they've been dispersed among the Gentiles. They've often been told to leave a city, and, and there are different reasons for that, but they were told to leave Rome, and so Aquila and Priscilla come to Corinth. And uh, it says, uh, and, and came unto them. So Paul meets them, and he... He stays with them, verse 3, because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. So they worked together, making tents. That's what it says, for by their occupation, they were tent makers. So Paul arrived at Corinth alone. He left Athens alone. He arrives in Corinth. His key fellow laborers are not with him when he gets there, but he soon met a Jewish married couple that became some of his dearest friends and most faithful fellow laborers in the ministry. And Paul lived and worked with them and, and, and therefore had the opportunity to teach them. And he showed them his message in ministry and they received it. Uh, we don't know for sure if he led them to Christ and then showed them what the Lord had revealed to them or maybe they had already believed on Christ and, uh, and then, but just didn't know what all the Lord had given Paul. But regardless, Paul obviously shares the truth with them, and they believe it, and they become part of his ministry. And uh, later on, they're going to help Apollos in the, at the end of the chapter, just like Paul brought them up to speed. They're going to be used of God to bring Apollos up to speed about what God was doing. But you're familiar, I'm sure, of, with Aquila and Priscilla. I mean, Paul mentions them three times in his epistles, and we'll look at those real quick. In uh, 1 Corinthians 16, or rather, let's start with Romans 16. Romans 16, verses 3 through 5. And then they're mentioned in 1 Corinthians 16, and then 2 Timothy 4. Romans 16, verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. They put their life on the line to stand with Paul and to help him. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles.
Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So uh, it's interesting, you know, Paul meets them at Corinth, but then when he writes Romans, and he writes that at the time of Acts 20, in the early part of the chapter, he mentions Aquila and Priscilla being in Rome, so they went back to Italy. They went back to Rome and were there when he wrote Romans, and they must have had some means. Uh, they must have had pretty good business going. I mean, they had a large enough house uh, to have the church meeting in their house, and uh, not just in Rome, but there's another place they were. If you go over 1 Corinthians 16, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Again, mentioned uh, that, you know, so they're in Asia, minor, when, and, and with Paul when he writes this, and again, a church is meeting in their house, and then look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 19. Salute Prissa and Aquila, same thing as Priscilla, uh, and the household of Anesphorus. So he's writing to Timothy, who is in Ephesus, and so they get around. <laughs> and they, they will host a church in their house, they'll let the church meet in their house, and they're just, Paul said, it really says it all when he said they lay, you know, they lay down their necks, basically, were willing to put their life on the line to help him. They were his helpers in Christ. And so, you know, you don't have to be a pastor or an evangelist to be fruitful in the Lord's work. Aquila and Priscilla were a married couple that served the Lord together. Uh, and the emphasis there is on together because they're always mentioned together. And sometimes you'll see in a marriage where, where one is more spiritual than the other and one is serving the Lord and the other is not. But here's an example where together they were serving the Lord. What a blessing. What a blessing that is, and I'm thankful for uh, couples in our church that are the same way. And, uh, you know, they were a, a, a major help to Paul. And so, you, you, again, they're not preaching, obviously, Priscilla's not, <laughs> but she is a faithful witness, and she's doing what she can to help, and there's uh, Aquila and Priscilla serving the Lord together. And, you know, in the ministry, you got to have what they call and I don't use this term, but they refer to lay people, you know, the clergy and the laity. That's religious nonsense. The Bible doesn't make that distinction. We're all one in Christ, and we labor together. Now, there, there is leadership, you know, that in the local church. You have those who are overseers, and I understand that. But really, we're brethren, and we ought to be laboring together. So you, you don't have to get up in a pulpit and preach a message to be, to be serving God. Just be faithful, Uh and I heard a preacher say years ago, he said, you ought to either pastor a church or help someone who is. And God uses the local church. And, it, you know, don't ever underestimate the importance of being faithful and being a help. You know, you're either being a help or a hindrance. May God help us to be a helper in the work of the ministry, not a hindrance. So Paul has nothing but good to say about Aquila and Priscilla. And so there, there, there are people that are in business, and they use what they make for the Lord's work. And money is not evil. It's the love of money, Paul said, is the root of all evil. And thank God for those faithful people that have some means, and they, and, and they use it in the Lord's work. I mean, um, God provides, but he provides through his people. And so, you know, our church has always had its needs met, praise the Lord, but, you know, never one time did God drop money down out of the sky. All the money that's come in through this ministry has come from God's people. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we ought to be cheerful givers, and we ought to do what we can to help the ministry. And you know, you know Priscilla. Now, she has to be a godly woman to let a church meet in her house all the time. That'd be a tough thing to do, if you think about it. But uh, they were faithful, and praise the Lord for people like that. I'm thankful for folks like that we have in our ministry. So Paul there is living with them and working with them, and so he's taught them a lot. I'm sure while they're making tents, he's not just talking about the tent. He's talking about 
the Lord Jesus Christ and what was revealed to him for this age of grace. And, uh, but Paul knew how to work with his hands, and he did so whenever it was needed. You know, the Jewish rabbis taught that a father who did not teach his son a trade basically was teaching him to be a thief. And so they were big on uh, teaching a trade. In fact, in Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Now, we can apply that to child training in terms of discipline, but I think the Proverbs probably more likely applicable to what we're talking about here, train them up in, in an occupation, and they'll stay with it all their life, something they can, can use, and, and something that, you know, it's important to have that ability to have some knowledge of something uh, to be able to, in fact, I think, you know, here's Paul, he's a preacher, he, he's an apostle, he's traveling around, and that he had churches that supported him, and it's right to do that, but sometimes he lacked support. Sometimes he wouldn't even take it, uh, like with the church at Corinth. Uh, he didn't want their support because of various reasons. He thought it'd be a hindrance, but he had something to fall back on when needed, and I think preachers should have some knowledge and experience of work outside the ministry to fall back on if needed. And uh, I worked different jobs before I went full-time in the ministry, and I, I would have no problem if, if it was needed for me to take on a different job. Now, I, I do give full-time to the ministry, so that's why I don't work another job. Uh, but if I had to, I would. I'm not afraid to do that. <laughs> um, so, but I'm fully dedicated to what God's given me to do. And, um, I, I, and I'm thankful I have that opportunity because the way I am, I'd get so engrossed in business, get so engrossed in trying to accomplish something, I would get distracted very easily from the work of the ministry. So I'm thankful God. God has allowed me to be full-time in the ministry for uh, uh, 20 years, and uh, I'm thankful for that. And um, some, some people say, oh, you ought to have another job, and all, a preacher shouldn't be full-time. That's not what Paul taught. Look at, um, look at 1 Corinthians 9 real quick. And by the way, while you're finding that, I'll read from Acts chapter 20, verse 34, where Paul told the Ephesian elders, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I've showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, in Ephesians 4, he talked about putting on the new man, he said, let him that stole steal no more, but rather labor, working with his hands the thing that is good that he may have to give to them that needeth. Um, if the Lord has given you opportunity to have resources, nothing wrong with having savings, nothing wrong with investing, there's nothing wrong with those things, but we ought to always be more of a channel than anything else of God. Uh, it's often been said, and I agree, God gives more through you than he does to you. If we use it for his work, you know, that's, that's important. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, see, here's the, you know, preachers, sometimes they have to work outside the ministry to meet the needs of their family. And, that, and that's, that's certainly permissible. That's not a problem. But Paul taught that ministers working outside the ministry was the exception, not the rule. And um, so 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 Verse number six, or I only and Barnabas, have we power to forbear working? Have not we power to forbear working? He said, we have to work outside the ministry to, make, to meet the needs, but it shouldn't be that way, because here's the reason. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit of the, uh, thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? That's a good question for all you animal lovers. Paul's point is not about the oxen. He's teaching a principle about for people. And people are more important than animals. You know, we live in a society that can't get that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not into uh, uh, cruelty toward animals. I, I take care of your animals. But good night, they're animals. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Or saith he altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that plows should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. And here's Paul's attitude about this. If we've sown unto you spiritual things, if we're working hard to sow to you the word of God, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? 
then that, it's just the right thing. It's, you know, you're not doing me any favor is what he's saying. He's saying, I'm working for you. And so the, the principle is, is that I should be supplied for. He said, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we've not used this power. He could have, but he didn't. But suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live with the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. See how he's making application from the Old Testament. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And you know, the laborer is worthy of his hire. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things that should be so done to me, for it were better for me to die than any man should make my glory void. So Paul was not a pastor. He was an apostle. And there were reasons he sometimes would not take support from churches like the church at Corinth. But he did take it from other churches. But the rule is, is that if you're going to live of the gospel, if you're going to preach the gospel and give yourselves fully to the Lord's work, then you got to live like everybody else. And so, you know, sometimes I know nobody here thinks this way, but over the years, because I'm full-time, there are some people who criticize that and say, pastor shouldn't get paid. And uh, now I don't get paid to preach. To me, what I do on Sunday and Wednesday night is just a, you know, I'm not being paid for that, but to give my time all week long to be able to do that and be able to do the work of the ministry, I got to take care of my family as well. Nobody, I'm not going to preach based on who gives me money. I'm not going to, I've never, by the grace of God, favored people if they give me more money or anything like that. No, you know, in other words, if a man is preaching for money, then he's got the wrong motive. Paul said it's not about filthy lucre. You shouldn't be in it for greedy gain. But if you're doing the Lord's work and you're given full time to doing the Lord's work, you've got to pay your bills just like everybody else. And some, some of these guys, I say, you know, probably is the case. I work harder at what I'm doing than you are what you do. And uh, I, I say it that way because there's some people, they draw a paycheck and, and they're, they're not working too hard at it. They just got one of those jobs where they can kind of coast along and get paid. And then they turn around and criticize somebody who's working hard in the Lord's work. And, uh, and by the way, I do work hard in the Lord's work. I'm not saying that to be cocky. I don't think anybody has ever accused me of not preparing for what I'm teaching and preaching. And anybody who knows what I'm doing during the week, nobody's ever said, oh, he doesn't, I am working, right? So that kind of attitude, and it's not in our church, but there are people out there like that. That needs to be corrected because that's the wrong attitude. You shouldn't treat pastors that way and have that bad attitude toward them. Now, there are hirelings out there. There are guys that aren't working in the ministry, and they're drawing a check, and they're deadbeats. And I think if a pastor's not doing what he ought to be doing, they ought to just get rid of him or whatever. I'm not, but I'm talking about if a man is giving himself fully to the Lord's work, then, you know, it's right to support that. And I know you understand that, but this is for the benefit of those out there who don't understand that, because I think that is an issue. And uh, I know of many preachers that they don't mind doing it. They'll work outside jobs, but sometimes... When you don't have to and it shouldn't be that way, that's a, that's a sad thing as far as I'm concerned because I'm thankful to, that I can give you know, full dedication to what God's given me to do. Life is short. I'm glad I don't have to spend 40 hours a week doing something just to put food on the table and then try to catch up when I can with the ministry. Now, I will say, there, are, and I don't know anybody's heart, but I, I think there are some out there, they, they'll keep that outside job because they got benefits and they're worried about their retirement and they're worried about their insurance, and so they could go full-time, and it's not the people keeping them, it's them. They don't want to give up that job because of the benefits. But my benefits are out of this world, you see, because they're definitely not here. <laughs> I plan to preach till I die, you know, and if I go senile before then, you're just going to have to deal with bad messages. But, I, you know, my retirement plan is, is, is heaven. <laughs> when I get there, I'll still be working, right? Anyway. All right, so back to Acts 18. Acts 18. There are some guys, even preachers, that criticize preachers that are full-time, and they say they shouldn't be taking money. And I guarantee you those birds, if somebody actually wanted to support their ministry and gave them some money, I guarantee you they'd keep it. Guarantee you they'd appreciate it. A lot of those guys, they're just, they just say that stuff because nobody wants to support what they're doing, and they're just upset about it. So they're trying to act like they're spiritual or something, you know. 
Uh, I see through all that junk. Acts 18, verse number 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said to them, Your blood be upon your own head. I'm clean. From henceforth I'll go unto the Gentiles. So Paul was working hard all week, making tents, and then spending the Sabbath days trying to reach the Jews and the Greeks in the synagogue. And um, yet while he was doing that, he was still very burdened for that young church back at Thessalonica that he knew was facing much affliction. And remember when he came to Athens, he had, he had sent word for, um, you know, he sent Timothy, when he, Timothy did come to Athens, he sent him to Thessalonica to check on that church and to help them and further establish them in the faith. But then whenever Silas and Timothy rejoin Paul, and it's here in Corinth when they rejoin him, uh, then they brought an encouraging report. Uh, Timothy had brought an encouraging report about the church in Thessalonica that they were standing strong and, and being faithful and they haven't departed from the truth. And, uh, and then uh, Silas... I guess, is the one that brought an offering from the church at Philippi. In 2 Corinthians chapter number uh, 11, verse 9, And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I've kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. And so... He's there by himself, but he, has, he now has Aquila and Priscilla, and they're helping him, and he's, he's so busy making the tents and reasoning with the Jews in the synagogue, but then whenever, whenever Timothy and Silas rejoin him here, uh, he gets you know, a boost, so to speak. He's, he's greatly encouraged about the church at Thessalonica staying true, and then also there was the brethren of Macedonia that wanted to support him, and that, that really helped meet the need there. And so it says in verse number uh, five, that whenever they were come from Macedonia, that Paul was pressed in the spirit and, and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Notice that pressed in the spirit and look back in chapter 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So his spirit, his human spirit, it was stirred. And then here in Acts 18, 5, it, he's pressed in the spirit. And then you see in Acts 19, verse 21, uh, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. And then you'll notice in Acts chapter 20, verse 22, and now, behold, I go in, bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. I'm just pointing out when Paul served the Lord, it wasn't just, he didn't just go through the outward motions. He was serving the Lord in his Spirit. And he mentioned that in Romans chapter 1, in verse number 9, how he served the Lord. Remember, he said in Romans 1, as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel. Well, in Romans 1, 9, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. And so we are regenerated in our spirit by the Holy Spirit, and uh, we need to yield ourselves. That door just opened. Can somebody go check and see what's going on? I don't see anybody, but the door opened. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I guess somebody came in and didn't close it good, but I'm talking about in the foyer there. I can see when somebody comes up to that door, I can see from up here. Sometimes it distracts me. But, um, but then again, it can be helpful if the wrong person's coming up, you know. We can, if somebody say, you worried about somebody coming in your church and shooting? They'll get shot 50 times before they get their gun out. I'll just say that. But anyway, he said in, in Romans 1 that uh, he served in the Spirit. And so, we, we need to yield our spirit to God's spirit, and serving God needs to start deep within. The deepest part of a man is his spirit. Proverbs says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching the innermost parts of the belly. And so we, we give ourselves, like Paul did, if we're going to be faithful, it's got to be in the spirit. And so 
Uh, he had been reasoning and persuading in the synagogue, but whenever he gets that boost of encouragement from Silas and Timothy coming and with the good reports that they had, he was pressed in the spirit and testified. That's a stronger word. Uh, he's putting it on the line here uh, and declaring to them, to the Jews, that Jesus was Christ. He's the promised Messiah, and he's proving it to them from the word of God. But what do they do? Well, you know, you know what happens. I mean, we've seen it so much already in Paul's uh, ministry where he would go into the synagogue and prove Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, raised from the dead, and some would believe, and to them he'd give the further revelation of what Christ gave them, but many of them wouldn't even believe that. They would reject that, and then they would begin to persecute. And so they, they are opposing, and notice how he put it, when they opposed themselves. They thought they were opposing Paul, but Paul had the truth. And by rejecting the truth, what they're really doing is opposing themselves. And they were opposing themselves by rejecting, and not just rejecting, but blaspheming the truth concerning Christ. If they're blaspheming, Paul's preaching Christ, and they are blaspheming him. To blaspheme is to speak against God. Christ is God. Just like you can blaspheme the Holy Ghost, that proves that the Holy Ghost is God. If you blaspheme Christ, that's showing that Christ is God. So back in Acts chapter 13, uh, remember those pivotal points we've shown you, Acts 13, 46, Acts 18, 6, and Acts 28, 28. Uh, this process of the diminishing of Israel, they've already fallen. Paul's not offering the kingdom to Israel, but there is a diminishing process, a transition period. In Acts 13, verse number 45, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. By not receiving the truth, they were not receiving everlasting life. And that was their choice. That's how they were opposing themselves. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And so same thing happens here in Corinth. And when they were blaspheming, he shook his raiment, which is... The Jews knew what that meant. I can take you back into Nehemiah for an example. In Nehemiah 5 verse 13 where the shaking of the raiment there is signifying judgment. And they knew what that meant. And he's saying you, you are opposing yourselves by doing this. And he said your blood be upon your own head. And that, that also would be hearkening back to the Old Testament in Ezekiel for an example chapter 3 but also chapter 33. And I won't read the whole passage, but you have the passage about the watchman. And the job of the watchman was to warn the people. And if he failed to warn the people, then their blood was on his head. He was responsible. He didn't warn them. But if he warned them and they rejected the warning, then their own blood would be on their own head because they rejected the warning. And um, Ezekiel 33, verse 7 so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman of the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. And so there's an application here because that's why Paul said in Acts chapter number 20, in Acts chapter 20, verse 26, he said, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men. He fulfilled his responsibility. Now, it, look, it's not our responsibility to get people to believe the word of God. We can't make them believe the word of God. God's not holding us accountable for whether people believe it or not. I'm not going to be held accountable at the judgment seat of Christ for results. I have no control over how many people get saved through my ministry. But what I do have control over is whether or not I'm going to be faithful. God's going to hold me accountable for my faithfulness to declare the truth. What people do with it is on their head. Now, Paul was a faithful witness so that every opportunity he had, he said, I'm ready to preach the gospel of Christ. May God help us to be faithful when we have opportunity to warn the wicked that if they die in their sin... They'll suffer eternal damnation. But salvation is available in Jesus Christ if they'll trust Christ as their Savior, believing he died for their sins and was buried and rose again, they'll be saved by grace through faith. And, and so uh, it's our responsibility to sound the warning. And Paul was doing that. He said, I am, I am clean. I have done what God told me to do. I have warned you. 
that if you reject Christ, you'll be damned. You're, you're opposing yourself. Your blood's on your own head. And he said, I, I, from henceforth, I'll go to the Gentiles. So for the remainder of his time at Corinth, Paul will primarily preach to the Gentiles. And by the way, when he said that in Acts 18, verse 6, he wasn't saying, I'll never preach to a Jew again, because he won't continue to preach to Jews. But he was just saying, all right, I've come here to this city. I've been in the synagogue. I've shown you Jesus as Christ. And those of you who are rejecting it, you know what? I'm leaving the synagogue now. I'm going out here to the Gentiles. And many of them are going to believe the message. And that's what happened. And so you have the unique thing about Paul's ministry. Well, there's a lot of unique things. But one of the main things is Romans 11, 11, I say then have they, to my Israel, stumbled that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall. So when Paul writes that in Acts 20, Israel had already fallen as a nation. So that blows Acts 28 uh, hyper-dispensationalism right out of the water. This idea that the body of Christ didn't start until Acts 28 is nonsense. They, Israel had already fallen uh, in the book of Acts. They fell in Acts 7 at the stoning of Stephen. And Paul said, through their fall, salvation's coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So Paul would go to the Jew first during the transition period because there was a remnant in Israel getting called out of unbelieving Israel into the body of Christ. And it, it was a transition period, but inevitably, when he'd go to the Jew first, most of them would reject the message. He would turn for them, from them, preach to the Gentiles, and Gentiles were getting saved and blessed without Israel. In prophecy, the Gentiles are blessed through Israel's rise and through being a blessing to Israel. Uh, through their instrumentality. But in this age, we're blessed without Israel. It's through their fall salvation is coming to the Gentiles. And so there's going to be another pronouncement of Paul against the unbelieving Jews in Acts 28, 28. But what happens in Acts 28, 28, when he said the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles and they'll hear it after those Jews in Rome were rejecting his message, that doesn't mark the beginning of something. It marks the end. It marks the end of the transition period. But the dispensation that we're living in began during the book of Acts, not afterward. So in Acts 28, 28, the transition period ends, the remnant in Israel has been reached, and the gospel is no longer to the Jew first. We don't have to go to the Jew first today. We go to all men alike. Paul went to the Jew first for, for a very definite reason during a particular time. Now, uh, Paul wrote the Thessalonian epistles from Corinth, by the way. And if you compare here in Acts 18 that Silas and Timothy come to Paul, and you go over, and we won't do it for time, but I've shown you this already in 1 Thessalonians 3, based on what Paul says in that chapter, you can see that Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians when he was at Corinth in Acts 18. And I happen to think it was his first epistle. I think Galatians was written toward the end of Acts 18, and we'll show you that next week. But uh, you're as far as the main thing about the order of the books of the Bible is, is the order God put them in for a dispensational purpose, and they're in the order they are for a reason. But if you're interested in learning about the chronological order, because they're not in chronological order, if you want to know that, you have to pick up on the clues in the Scripture itself and just forget about those dates in your study Bible because they're just, they're just guessing, okay? Acts 18, verse 7. Acts 18, verse 7. And he departed thence and entered to a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. So he leaves the synagogue and goes next door. It was like a duplex. <laughs> I mean, just his house was slapped next to the synagogue. He went out one door, went a few feet, and went in another door. So I'll just go over here. And Justice was a Gentile that feared God uh, because it's pointed out that he worshiped God. So it's, it's being specific because he's a Gentile that worshiped God, and he just said, I'm, I'm going to the Gentiles. So it makes sense that the man next door was actually a God-fearing Gentile. Verse 8, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now, as he goes next door into this house of justice, he, many are getting saved, as it says in verse number 8. 
And if you read 1 Corinthians, you'll notice that the church at Corinth was a church that had all of the sign gifts, supernatural manifestations. And if you study 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, uh, you understand about these gifts, and you also understand they've ceased. The sign gifts were in use during the transition period, and, and I don't have time right now. We're almost done with this lesson. I've taught on this in other studies. But Paul said when he wrote about those gifts that they would cease, and they have. If you understand, you know, what he's talking about in, at the end of 1 Corinthians 13. But what they were, those sign gifts were provoking the unbelieving Jews to jealousy. Paul said in Romans 11 to provoke them. These Gentiles were getting saved without them, and then they had these manifestations of the Spirit of God, and they would speak prophecy, and they would speak in other languages they did not know. And the gift of tongues was not some kind of heavenly language. It was a language on the earth. It was just one they didn't know. But they would supernaturally speak in other languages, and then it would be interpreted. And that was a sign to the unbelieving Jews. Paul said tongues were a sign to the unbelieving Jews. That was the purpose of it. And because it was prophesied that God would speak to those people uh, with other tongues in Isaiah chapter 28. And so they're being provoked to jealousy. At least some of them got the message because Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, gets saved. Leaves the synagogue. I'm sure they wanted him when he get, believed on Christ. They told him to get to step in anyway. They put him out of the synagogue and he went next door. And, there, and he's in that church made up primarily of Gentiles. And... Uh, Crispus and his family got saved, and put, they were put out of the synagogue. And, and um, he was one of the few, by the way, that Paul baptized out of the many. There were many in Corinth that were baptized after they believed. And he talks about this, and we'll look at this next time. We, we've already said some things about this in Acts 16, about Lydia and the jailer. But we'll, we'll look at it again in 1 Corinthians 1. That's, that's the only passage he mentions water baptism in all of his epistles. And he's referring to the church at Corinth. Uh, as far as the few that he baptized there, it's interesting that there were many baptized there, but Paul only baptized a handful of them, couldn't even remember for sure the, the ones that he did. And there's a reason why he says, talks about it like that, and we'll look at that next time. But they, Paul, he, you know, all these Gentiles are getting saved. Many is the word that was used. Many believed. So you know what Paul's expecting. I mean, everywhere he's gone, it's been the same thing. Go to the Jew first. The majority of them would reject the message. He'd go to the Gentiles. And when Gentiles started to get saved, then the unbelieving Jews would try to get him out of the area. So Paul's expecting some persecution. And the Lord appears in a vision and says, don't go anywhere. I, I, there's much people here in this city. And by the way, that's not talking about people who had not gotten saved yet. Uh, the, the Calvinist likes to use that verse to say that's the elect. And, 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 and they're already saved as far as God's concerned. They just don't know it yet. And when he said, I have much people in this city, the verse before that was talking about many had believed. He's saying, you need to stay here and teach them the word of God. And that's what he does. It says that he stayed there a year and a half teaching the word of God among them. So there's a number, and I won't give you the references because we're out of time, and I'll do this next time. Uh, there are a number of references in the book of Acts to the Lord speaking to Paul in a vision. It happens like six times. And so Paul was an apostle who saw the Lord and was sent directly by the Lord, and the Lord made appearances to him. And so he ends up staying in Corinth for a year and a half, which is the longest up to this point, as far as we know, that he stayed in the city during his journeys. He's going to stay at Ephesus even longer, as we're going to see in Acts 19. But... Let me find a stopping point here. Again, when it says in verse number 8 that the chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his house, well, as we've already seen, those in his house that were old enough to hear the gospel and believe it, not to, there's no record at all in the word of God of an infant being baptized, only those that believe. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So what we know People like to argue about this, about baptism during Paul's ministry. Well, what we know for sure is it had nothing to do with their salvation. Because in 1 Corinthians 1, when he talks about this, he said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So we know for sure that the baptism, if someone would have said, these people must be baptized to be saved, we can bank on it. Paul would have said, no, we're not doing that. But that's not the case. 
this is different. This is not, you understand, Peter told the men of Israel, repent, be baptized for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That was a different message in a different context. That's not what Paul's doing here. These people were baptized after they believed. All right, now, we're going to see next time, this is not something that Paul required, and there's some speculation as to why it occurred, and we can talk about that. But the, the point to get the church is started here in Corinth, and, uh, and, and so the Lord is going to have him stay here for a while, and he knew what kind of church this was going to be and had him stay longer than usual, and even so, think about it, even so, even though Paul himself taught them for a year and a half, when he wrote to them, he had to rebuke them for their carnality. And uh, I want to make this point as we close, that the church that had all the sign gifts, they had all the sign gifts, they didn't come behind in any gift, was the most carnal church Paul started. <laughs> so you got a lot of people today talking about if you're spiritual, you'll have these gifts. Those people had the gifts because God just zapped them with it. They had nothing, it wasn't because they were so great. He just, God gave them the gift because he wanted to. It had nothing to do with their spirituality because they weren't even spiritual. They were abusing the gifts. <laughs> so this idea that if you're really filled with the Holy Ghost today, you'll speak with tongues, that's not true. I'll tell you this, if you're trying to speak with tongues today, it proves you're not spiritual at all. Because you don't, you're not spiritual enough to understand that that gift ceased when the word of God was completed. And so we'll talk more about, we'll pick it up there next time. Say some more things about the church at Corinth getting started, and then we'll work our way down through the remainder of the chapter. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we had in your word this morning. Help us to understand the things we studied, and I pray you'll bless the service to follow. We ask this in Christ's name.